situation in Armenia, but when I started working on, 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 on this theme, art and scholarship in moments of historical danger, it was in February and uh, <laughs> we are hit by uh, the pandemic. Uh, so <clears throat> I decided that nothing would stop us <laughs> now. Um, this is an unfinished work, so I'm just going to present some readings of um, um, seminal texts within uh, 20th century art history, art historiography, um, in relation to uh, the role of art and scholarship and the humanities in uh, moments of what Walter Benjamin would call historical danger. Um, and uh, basically when I was preparing a kind of a call for Art Margins, a journal that I'm also co-editor of, for our anniversary issue for Roundtable, and I invited uh, several prominent scholars to respond to the theme, um, which was again, art and scholarship in moments of historical danger. Some of them, um, seminal art historians, were unsure if it is time to say anything or what is to be said, right? We are facing multiple crises. There is a sense that the university as we knew it or know it is um, no longer <laughs> there. And we don't know how we are going to come out um, after the pandemic and uh, other kinds of, you know, more maybe you know, pathetic crises in, as in like full of pathos that are hitting us both in Lebanon, but now also in Yerevan where I am uh, at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's always time for thinking, there's always time for positioning our work in relation to the concrete and specific historical moment. And in this context, I wanted to revisit um, the history of the discipl discipline from two politically and ideologically contradictory positions uh, that we will uh, hear in a moment. Again, this is not a finished work. I mean, I'm not driving kind of a forceful argument through, uh, but perhaps sharing uh, some of this, let's say, humanistic heritage through the discipline with you. Um, so I want to revisit some of the moments in our recent past, especially in the 20th century, as a way of foregrounding the necessity of a re-articulation of knowledge, pedagogy, art and scholarship as expedient undertakings in our moment of historical danger precisely when the neoliberal technologies of governmentality with their ideology of instrumentalizing knowledge declare arts and humanities passé or redundant or as vestiges of a historical era that has been supposedly overcome along with history with capital H as such. Um, so I'm going to go back to the 30s first and actually in our moment, uh, in our historical moment, I myself, I'm having a lot of uh, um, maybe <laughs> deja vu, if that's the right word, um, that we are very close or similar to the moment of the 30s um, when we, with, the, with the Nazis encroaching upon, uh, encroaching upon the world. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, there was a mobilization, right, of, uh, let's say, um, forces, liberal, socialist, and so on to combat uh, the rise of Nazism. Today, the enemy is much more hidden. Uh, much more, much less identifiable. So I'm going to revisit in the 30s um, when the hopes for a world socialist revolution had almost entirely faded away and the war in Europe started to seem inevitable. And when philosophers and art historians both from the left and the liberal humanist camps were articulating a relationship between art and scholarship in utmost political terms. But we'll see that uh, those political terms are very different. So in this moment of what Benjamin called historical danger and as Nazis were encroaching upon the world, questions of emancipatory pedagogy, humanistic heritage and free and non-instrumental pursuit for truth were being foregrounded as once inseparable from the historical destiny of modern humanity. On the left, the true universality of arts and humanities was seen as possible only through their articulation in terms of class struggle. Hence, true universality was conceived as impossible to disentangle from the emancipation of the proletariat that for Marx was the only universal class because it ensured the material reproduction of the entire society through its labor. As opposed to this and given the vulgar instrumentalization of arts and humanities in Stalin's Russia throughout the 30s, the liberal humanist and conservative camp in the West largely defended the free and autonomous pursuit for truth and knowledge as political weapons against what they saw 
as forces of darkness. If from the perspective of the communists and the socialist left, universality and truth were entwined and scholarship was seen as political and ideological in and of itself, <coughs> For the liberal humanists, the idea of a value-free and autonomous pursuit of knowledge was envisioned as um, militant humanism deployed as a weapon against the ideological enemy. But despite the differences, what both sides shared was the political role of the arts and humanities in the context, uh, in the moments of historical danger. So I'm going to begin with a seminal essay uh, by Erwin Panofsky from 1938, art historian, uh, who was in exile in the United States in the wake of the Nazis takeover of Germany and who delivered a lecture um, which became a sort of a manifesto for humanistic art history. Published a year later in 39, the history of art as a humanistic discipline was a restitution of the humanistic foundations of scholarship against what Panofsky saw as two camps who threatened the scholarship. Even if he did not explicitly name the enemies, the determinists on the one hand and the vitalists or hero worshippers on the other, in the historical context of his address, it is clear that this rhetoric was directed against the Nazis and the Stalinists alike. The humanist for Panofsky who rejects authority but respects tradition steps in to uncover the very tradition of humanism autonomously vis-a-vis -vis instrumentalizing political and ideological forces. The autonomous pursuit for truth then has a political function because it is dysfunctional or it is, un it is, it is not functional for political purposes. Scholarship instru instrumentalized avant la lettre is servant to the forces that advance untruth and non-freedom. That is for Panofsky, the contemporary forces of barbarism. In Panofsky's prog programmatic address, humanism as a measure and the limit to these extremities is grounded in the idea of the human that moderates between the poles of anima animality and divinity, fragility and freedom. It is not worthy that he begins with an anecdote about the ailing Kant, Emmanuel Kant greeting the doctor. And I quote this at length. Uh, this is how Panofsky starts his essay. He says, nine days before his death, Emmanuel Kant was visited by his physician. Old, ill, and nearly blind, he rose from his chair and stood trembling with weakness and muttering unintelligible words. Finally, his faithful companion realized that he would not sit down again until the visitor had taken a seat. This he did, and Kant then permitted himself to be helped to his chair, and after having regained some of his strength, said, sorry for my German, das Gefühl für Humanität hat mich noch nicht verlesen. The sense of humanity has not left me. The two men were moved almost to tears for through the world, humanitat had come in the 18th century to mean little more than politeness or civility. It had for Kant a much deeper significance, which the circumstances of the moment served to em emphasize man's proud <clears throat> and tragic consciousness of self approved and self imposed principles, contrasting with his utter subjection to illness, decay, and all that is implied in the world, world mor mortality end of the quote. It is precisely man's proud and tragic consciousness of self-approved and self-imposed principles under the Kantian legislative authority of reason that drives Panofsky to step in defense of the very tradition of reason seen under threat in his own present. This tradition, while culturally and historically specific, yet is also universal. The humanist who studies human culture historically constructs a universal cultural tradition through scholarly scrutiny and autonomous critical pursuit for truth. Truth and freedom can be discovered only through an impartial scholarly engagement with the past that is both ours and yet foreign to us because it's of a different time and place. The labor of this tradition, if I <laughs> use a more Benjaminian word, is that, is that while historically transformed and reworked by generations, it is always already present in the scholar's own context. We are the heirs of the Renaissance humanists who have revived the tradition of antiquity, which in turn 
has pres was preserved in a transformed way in the Middle Ages. I quote, no medieval man could see the civilization of antiquity as a phenomenon complete in and of itself and historically detached from the contemporary world. He says in a footnote, end of the quote. The classical humanist stands on the side of the continuity of tradition vis-a-vis -vis the modernist negation of it, with someone who brings out records from the stream of time to study them. Every humanist for Panofsky is also ultimately a historian. I quote, from a humanistic point of view, human records do not age. End of the quote. Yet for Panofsky, tradition was not unassailable and immutable. And the humanist had an active role in uncovering it in the, in, in the present as a very precondition of preserving the human values of rationality and freedom with the recognition of human frailty. The light of the knowledge of the past would guide the present towards the universality of truth and freedom with the humanist being the torchbearer in this path to universality. To the question, why do we need to be interested in a non-practical venture? Why do we need to investigate the past as humanists? The past as humanists, Panofsky's answer is, I quote, because we are interested in reality. End of the quote. But this is the reality of the vita contemplativa or the contemplative life, which for the idealist Panofsky is as real as the vita activa or our practical life. And this mutually constitutes one another. And it is through the mind's capacity, right, he's a Kantian as well, that it is possible also to shape reality. He asks, why are we interested in the past? Because we are interested in reality, again. There is nothing less real than the present. The humanist then animates the past by enlivening what would otherwise remain dead, end of quote. So while Panofsky's, and, and, and again, we need to note, right, that this is 1938, 39, um, just very soon Nazis would invade Czechoslovakia, um, they would, the Anschluss would take place, the Stalin-Ribbentrop Pact would be uncovered, etc. Would be would be actually signed, uh, etc. While Panofsky's critical humanism advanced the belief that it is through the autonomous pursuit of truth that civilization can be wrestled from the forces of barbarism. Walter Benjamin, another exile from Germany in Paris in the 30s, conceived civilization and barbarism um, is implicated in one uh, another rather than in terms of uh, in, in, on oppositional terms. For Benjamin, the very history of civilization cannot be disentangled from the barbarism of oppression, and yet one cannot simply overcome culture and civilization in the name of barbarism. The role of the historical materialist for Benjamin was precisely to see the other side of culture, civilization, and tradition all the lofty pillars of universal humanity that the bourgeois sciences propagate and to uncover a tradition of the oppressed. For Benjamin, this tradition is an impossible one because it is unspoken and unwritten. Basically, it's not constituted, right, as a tradition, as a record. It is not constituted through documents and written testimonies, but appears in the etymological sense of the Latin root ad parare, coming into view in the moment of danger. This momentary flash that crystallizes in a dialectical image, the dreams and wishes of the historically oppressed for liberation, renders history its, its, itself as a construction or construction. This allows the historical materialist to seize upon this moment and uncover the impossible tradition of the oppressed from the specificity of the historical situation one finds himself or herself in. Thus, for Benjamin, tradition is not an immutable, un, un, Im, immutable and unquestioned archive of the heritage of human culture, accumulated dead objects inherited through a chain of historical causality, but the reverse side of cultural heritage. And for Panofsky, this tradition is not dead as well, it's the humanist who animates them. But the tradition itself is animatable, right? If we can say it that well. This tradition for Benjamin addresses the receiver in his or her own his, his historical situation, 
as an image that flashes from the past in moments of historical danger. And it is precisely in these moments when one catastrophe piles up upon another and when the present appears as nothing but a cul-de-sac that the question of the appropriation of tradition emerges in its utmost political articulations. In a relatively obscure essay on the collector and art historian Edvard Fuchs of 1937, which actually Benjamin didn't even want to write, it was a commission from uh, uh, Adorno at the New School and he wrote it because he needed money. Benjamin foregrounds the inherently political question of knowledge, pedagogy and cultural heritage in the proletariat's historical quest for emancipation. He begins the essay with a quote from a letter from Engels addressed to Mehring from 1893. Um, and I'm going to quote it at length and perhaps uh, I can share my screen uh, very uh, briefly for that. Yes. Um, okay. He says, it is above all this appearance, shine, of an autonomous history of constitutions of legal systems and of ideological conceptions in each specialized field of study, which deceives most people. When Luther and Calvin overcome the official Catholic religion, when Hegel overcomes Fichte and Kant, and when Rousseau indirectly overcomes the constitutional work of Montesquieu in his Contrat Social, this is a process which remains theology, philosophy, and government. This process represents a stage in the history of these disciplines and in no way goes outside of these disciplines themselves. And since the bourgeois illusion of the eternity and finality of capitalist production entered the picture, the overcoming of the mercantilists by the physiocrats and Adam Smith is seen as a mere victory of thought rather than as the reflection in thought of changed economic facts. Thus, this victory becomes the finally achieved correct insight into actual relations which always and everywhere existed. End of the quote. Through Engels, Benjamin confronts the autonomous development of the disciplines with its construction, with the construct, their construction of dogmas based upon earlier ideas. The separation between the disciplines from the practical life activity of men and women and the close unity of the disciplines. It thus questions whether disciplinary boundaries or their distinct modes of demarcation and separation are capable of providing interpretative and epistemological frameworks for understanding and intervening in the social totality in the capitalist conditions of production. Ultimately, from a historical materialist perspective, any abstraction of knowledge from the social relations of production relegates the former to the bourgeois separation of spheres and preconditions and contemplative attitude towards the historical present. Panofsky's Vita Contemplativa, detached from Vita Activa. The humanities are especially prone to these abstractions because theory and practice in them appear as further removed from one another. Actually a separation that Panofsky bridges and I didn't have time to, I don't have time to go through it, um, saying that every practical activity is always already informed by theory. When you're run over by a truck, for example, you're run over by physics and geometry at the same time. This is because humanity, the humanities are traditionally conceived, why these abstractions persist there? Because human, the humanities are traditionally conceived as the domain of the spirit or Geises Wissenschaft, detached from economic conditions. When referring to the failures of the social democrats to address the education of the proletariat in terms of class, and in a line that sounds more actual today than ever, Benjamin states, I quote, the humanities were satisfied to stimulate, to offer diversion or to be interesting. History is disembodied while cultural history is preserved. End of the quote. This thought is rather complex and has to do with the notion of heritage in German Erbe and heritability. While heritage and hence entire culture is seen as bourgeois culture, it is the proletariat that with its decisive place in the apparatus of production that moves the entire will of the cultural apparatus as well. In short, it is labor that indirectly also reproduces the entire apparatus of culture as cultural heritage. 
alienated from culture, then the working class seeks refuge in natural science. <clears throat> and technical fields, right? The detachment of cultural history, history and humanities in general from economy relegates the workers' struggle to the sphere of economic production while preserving culture as the domain of the bourgeoisie. Hence, for Benjamin, any revolutionary transformation cannot merely take place in the base, but needs to occupy the superstructure and the intermediate spheres between them. Of course, it's another discussion that perhaps we can leave for later, um, how culture itself can be revolutionized, whether we can have a revolutionary means, right, for cultural change, because the temporality of culture is very different from the tempor temporality of political um, revolutions. Um, and I mean, arguably, in moments when culture has been instituted politically uh, through revolutionary processes, such as during Stalinism, um, uh, during Stalin's first turn uh, and second turn between 1928 and 32 and thereafter, but also Mao's cultural revolution, um, whether they've succeeded in revolutionizing culture is another question because the cult temporality of culture itself is, is, is very slow but we can leave this for later. In a move that resonates with Panofsky's attention to the history of natural sciences as part and parcel of the humanistic heritage, and I will not go into this, I don't have time for that, Benjamin insists on the historical understanding of sciences themselves. For instance, for him, technology is no mere scientific phenomenon. It is also a historical one that brings about a historical mode of production. The social democrats in his time, like today's technocrats, blindly trust in technology, including the technology of governance that we see today. And this trust is combined with their evolutionary waiting on, waiting until the technological advancement itself would bring about the appropriation of the means of production by the proletariat. And the price the social democrats had to pay for this waiting on was the advent of Nazism. The historical dimensions of science and technology is combined here with the materialist embeddedness of cultural history in class struggle. This intertwining allows Benjamin to call for the overcoming of cultural history, one that is possible when one recognizes class struggle as its kernel. This recognition entails that the historical materialist who overcomes the cultural historian as the custodian of heritage, treats all spheres of life activities integrated. If the historical materialist, despite her uneasiness with the concept of culture, doesn't transform culture materialistically, then culture will disintegrate into, I quote Benjamin, goods which become objects of possession for mankind. And the past could even drop conveniently, think like, into mankind's hip, uh, lap. This may be what we had with postmodernism later on. To view cultural history as an ever incomplete endeavor, as well as part of the history of production and reception that confronts the historian like a dialectical flash in his or her own presence, present, is to resist the fetishization and reification of culture, its completion in thing-like objects. If Benjamin calls for a sublation of cultural history, or it's overcoming, right, kind of in, a, in, in German sense of Aufheben, into historical materialism in the moment of historical danger, Panofsky sees the humanistic foundations of cultural history as prerequisite for the survival of human ideals in the midst of their barbaric defacing. However, despite the stark contrast between the two, both positions envision the scholar's active and interventionist role in the very constitution of the historical present. Of course, for Panofsky, the present is not reality, right? It is the past that it enlivens the present with reality or endows the present with reality, while for Benjamin, the past as such can only be called upon um, through a flash in the present. In a way, this very dynamic of engaged scholarship from diametrically opposed political positions gets replayed in the 60s in what seems as completely opposite, again, camps, political camps of art historical scholarship. And this part is shorter than, um, the, than the 30s, Panofsky and Benjamin Tandem. On the one hand, in the 60s, um, we have Ernst Gombrich's defense of cultural history in search of cultural history of 19, 69 that he delivered uh, the court hold, which actually echoes an earlier piece from 
1957, which is less known, Art and Scholarship, a piece that my friend uh, and colleague Vartana Zatian calls an art historical manifesto of Cold War liberalism. So on the one hand, we have Gombrich's defense of cultural history. And on the other hand, I want to bring the opposite side, at least I'm kind of constructing these oppositions now. Uh, T.J. Clark's, art historian T.J. Clark's repoliticization of the discipline through revisiting um, the political moments of the 19th century when art and politics could not be disentangled. Gombrich's essay, um, I, I begin with him, which is based on a 67 lecture the court told, attempts to read cultural history from the Hegelian ghosts. And Hegel was <laughs> a big ghost for the liberal camp. And of course, I will not go into this, but um, uh, we know that Karl Popper, who famously wrote The Open Society and Its Enemies, um, was friends with Gombrich. So it's profound, Gombrich's profound anti-Hegelianism combined with what Andrew Hemingway calls methodological individualism, which is um, wherein social phenomena, right, are explained through subjective individual motivations. Um, this is what characterizes Gombrich's scholarship. He propagates the study of the past with a focus on individual human beings in their concrete situation from which a true cultural history, as opposed to a supra-individual history of the spirit, the Hegelian spirit, might emerge. This search Gombrich carries out through the exorcism of the Hegelian ghost from cultural history, a ghost that had conceived of history as rational, meaningful, and teleological, and he says, constructed through the, I quote, the ascent of logical categories till the divine at last comes to self-awareness in the mind of Herr Professor Hegel. Or one does not argue with the absolute, right? So this kind of authoritative position um, that Gombrich profanates in a way. For Gombrich, cultural history would not be possible without the modern belief in progress, because it is this belief that becomes a unifying force for mankind. But because culture could progress, it could also decay. And it is against this decay or the threat of decay that the cultural historian is fighting in a very militant sense. And of course, like in a Cold War context, this methodological individualism is posited um, against the Soviet camp on the one hand, but on the other hand, as we'll see against uh, what Gombrich saw, commercialization of culture in his own context of England. It was, by the way, another <coughs> uh, Austrian emigre who during the war uh, worked uh, for, um, I think, the British forces. He was doing the radio uh, translation of the signal from the Nazis. So here in the search for cultural history, Gombrich calls for an enlightened popularization of cultural history because our past, he says, is moving away from us at frightening speed, end of quote. The reinvention of cultural history on his account is the moral duty of the cultural historian who is paid by the taxpayer and who should service him um, and should service the taxpayers. Instead of a cloistered scholar who conducts research from his or her isolation, Gombrich advocates for a humanist education, educator as a popularizer of cultural history. And we all know that Gombrich's story of art was printed in multiple editions, multiple copies. I think in the 90s, we have uh, late 90s, I think, a Penguin edition. It's super <coughs> easy to, to read. It's a popular art, his, art arts history, <laughs> art story, story of art. Um, and notably, he also, um, I think in the 30s, wrote a book, um, something like 100 Days Around the World, or the, <laughs> the Story of the World, <laughs> sorry. As opposed to the contemplative, um, academic who conducts obscure research from the isolation of his discipline, the activist role of the cultural historian for Gombrich is to unshelf the past for the contemporary present. Gombrich goes as far as associating humanistic education with culture itself. His advocacy for an activist yet autonomous scholarship is driven by a Cold War methodological individualism fed by the fear of the ghost of totalitarianism on the one hand and the ever encroaching commercialism on the other. <clears throat> Yet Gombrich is also careful not to provide ammunition with his critique of the Hegelian tradition of cultural history to the technicists that in uh, academy advanced narrow specialization at the expense of an all-around humanistic education. 
By the way, he also received like a Hegel uh, prize. <laughs> students are frequently, he says, uh, I quote uh, Gombrich, students are frequently advised to keep this straight and narrow path to the finals <laughs> and onwards to research, leaving vast areas of the forest unvisited and unexplored. It will be a sad day when we allow the techniques we have learned or which we teach to dictate the questions which can be asked in our universities. End of the question, uh, quotation. If the humanities were to survive at all, they need to resist narrow specialization and technicism. Humanistic education here is aimed at knowledge, but knowledge which used to be called culture, nostalgically claims Combrich. And around the same time, but from a completely different position, T.J. Clark's triangulation of art, politics, and art history attempts to revive another heritage, the heritage of the revolutionary century in France, the 19th century. In 1973, Clark publishes two books, um, The Absolute Bourgeois and The Image, Image of the People, Gustave Courbet, and The 1848 Revolution, where He's attempting what he says to reconstruct the period in which art was disputed, even an effective part of, uh, historic, of the historical process. This, um, in, 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 a, in a seminal introduction, um, in search for, a, no, not in search, the social history of art, um, Clark defines the social history of art in the wake of the situation is the international, which he was, by the way, part of, Maoism, post-Stalinism, and, the meta and um, it, is, it is basically um, animated, this, this manifesto, we can call, him, call it his methodological manifesto. It is animated by the methodological re rejection of the sociology of art on the one hand and historicism. So what sociology of art does, right? It derives artistic uh, phenomena uh, from sociological and economic processes directly. This is the Arnold Hauser School. And historicism that relies on kind of this positivist uh, notion of uh, historical causality and the laws that uh, guide this causality. Methodological rejection of the history of styles uh, here is combined with a um, with a con consideration of forms um, that of, of artistic form, wherein uh, there are no longer hidden there are no hidden analogies between form and social content. Setting aside the habitual structures of art historical analysis, Clark states that we need concrete analysis, uh, but cannot also avoid general theories that inform this analysis. Um, so what Clark is trying to do in this uh, uh, introduction, but also throughout the book, more, the, the, the two books I mentioned much more concretely, right? Um, he says, I want to uncover what concrete transactions are hidden behind the mechanical image of reflection, art reflecting reality, right? To know how background, the context so-called, becomes foreground, and instead of analogy between form and content, to discover the network of real complex relations between the two. These mediations are themselves historically formed and historically altered. In the case of each artist, each work of art, they are historically specific. End of the quote. So here the artist works through and with artistic tradition, but needs to stand above his own artistic milieu, aesthetic milieu, or the aesthetic ideologies of his time. And this is the base, basically the avant-garde claim, right? The work of art is part of the historical process, but also it's an outcome of other factors as much as it also fits back into them. So the very language of art through which content and form are articulated is what brings about its historical effectiveness through artistic means. In the aftermath of 1968 and its defeat, in a way, we always have defeated revolution and revolutions. And in the context of uh, Rappel Lord, a return to order, Clark, who was a member of the Situationist International, through what he calls social art history, evokes those historical moments in 19th century France, Courbet, Millet, uh, Manet, Baudelaire, and his uh, uh, surroundings, his, 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 his friends, where the revolutionary situation opened up a space for the artist not only to render social truth visit, visible, but also to be in the vanguard of revolutionary transformation through artistic practice as an inherently political practice. But also Clark specifically studies especially these moments, right? 
And what is at stake for him, was at stake for him, arguably, was to restitu restitute the history of class struggle through art as a critical pedagogical means of intervening in the contradictions of the post-1968 moment, a moment when the critical role of art and culture in relation to late capitalist reification was at stake. In the conditions of the disillusionment from art's entanglement with politics, um, art history for Clark becomes, comes to resuscitate this entanglement on historical terms and provides an afterlife to avant-garde's unstable role within the sh shifting social order. In a way, what I argue for Clark art history, revisiting these moments of um, um, entwining of art and polit politics, becomes an, an art historical scholarship, becomes a placeholder for the politics of art in the context of post-1968, the failure of the avant-garde, right, to sublate art in life praxis, if we borrow from Peter Burger and so on. So I'm going to just like leave, uh, leave you with this. Of course, the conclusion is missing, but I think um, I'd like to open up for discussion so that we can, um, we can perhaps um, bring these questions, the, the questions of uh, cultural heritage, uh, with quotation marks, without, uh, but also the heritage, right, of um, our our discipline, as I tried to kind of summarize through these uh, four figures, and to our contemporary present, and um, perhaps open up the discussion of what is to be done, right? What can we do in conditions when uh, um, our work often seems uh, passé or redundant, or the university itself is changing in its shape, um, and uh, and uh, um, and goals and also technologies, right? That are coming to also almost like take the place uh, the bureauc bureaucratic technologies within the neoliberal university make it seem as if you know our teaching and research is simply adjacent to uh, the very structure of bureaucratization or very processes of bureaucratization. Um, thank you. If uh, I. I'd love to hear comments, questions. Um, I know this was dense and um, I guess uh, also it would have been good if people have read the text, but again, we didn't share the readings. Perhaps we, we failed in this way, but if, if there are any questions, I'll be hope, happy to engage. Thank you, Angela. Do you want me to field the questions or you're, you're good with doing that? Um, maybe we can do it together in case I miss okay. something. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let me see, who do we have? Um, I guess if people have questions, you can just uh, jump in and then if um, it becomes too complicated, we can use the chat box or raise hands. But personally, I'm usually lost when I'm looking for the hand raising thing. Uh, I can ask something. But yeah, my, I put my video on. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, I, so, me is just a kind of uh, a bibliographic remark that I think relates to that, which is the discipline and punishment of Foucault, which I think he made a genealogy of human sciences in relation to power. Uh, so I think it can echo well with these concerns. Now, I think the analysis of Foucault is good in this regard because uh, it's, if he takes the mutation of university, I think in uh, discipline and punishment, Foucault shows that the old form of university, the one, the in-class teaching, for example, whose roles and uh, the presence of the professor and stuff like that pertain to the disciplinary uh, model where you had to behave and control uh, discipline your body and this allowed an individualization of the students and, uh, and a very specific science uh, called pedagogy 
that can trace the performance of each one. And he shows you how these techniques of power, as he calls them, lead to something which is a human, uh, I'm mentioning here pedagogy, but he, he covers also psychology and psychiatry and all, all the other kind of uh, sociology, etc. And he shows that human sciences are really related to this uh, disciplinary era that he practically expands from the French Revolution to the Second World War and his even to the First World War, uh, more or less, uh, it's these little epochs that he deals with. And uh, so, so I, I thought that it would be that his conceptuality was what he was the way he's able to define that in terms of uh, technologies of power, regimes of perception, and how objects are created. Uh, could be useful here. For example, for him today's use of control technologies like computers and the like, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it pertains to a new regime of uh, a new regime of power and technology of power that will yield itself its own sciences. So you know, today we're starting to have uh, data engineers and statistical engineers that can calculate uh, all kinds of uh, rates and uh, and the like so these are new objects that appear okay. so so i just thought that here discipline and punish could be quite uh, useful here uh, for for those who uh, you know uh, so so i think this is how i would uh, tackle the question what do we do with heritage culture and how to make history in me i would say i would think that i would go this way like to, to show how power reflects into a set of uh, objects like human sciences mm -hmm. and how these uh, sciences serve power, and, you know, it's their model. So I, yes. I actually have a question for I you, Farad. Yeah. You, you are also, you know, you're also um, a Deleuzean. Uh, <laughs> I mean, do, do, do you think like... Yeah, I kind of, uh, it's cut. I'll turn off my camera because it's cutting. Okay. Yes. I was I was going to ask you a question since uh, um, you you work on Deleuze as well. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was wondering, do you think like we're more in the Foucauldian you know, society of the discipline or the Deleuze and society of control? Um, what are the you know modes of operations yeah. that distinguish the two, and where are we now? But. I mean, I don't know, for me, kind of the, the framework of power is, yes, is a, is a valid analytical framework, but it's also quite limited in the sense that, um, it, I mean, power, it becomes something omnipotent and omnipresent, um, almost, like, <laughs> almost like a Hegelian spirit. I mean, I know I'm kind of, it's, a blasphemous, it's blasphemous to say such a thing uh, for Foucault, um, that does not, there's, there's no way to break from it, right? It's almost like becomes kind of an, once power becomes um, disciplinary power, institutes itself within modernity, it becomes this almost like transhistorical force that is uh, impossible to overcome or like break from, there's no outside to it. So like, I guess like two comments or questions in one, okay. one goes for core, one power. Yeah, so, so for, uh, you can hear. So, so for the, the disciplinary uh, Foucauldian or uh, control Deleuze, I think, you know, in the commentary of Deleuze on Foucault, he says that the first one to point to an, to an, to an end of the disciplinary era was Foucault himself, was, uh, was when he made his uh, course on, uh, on biopower. And he talked, a lot, he talked a lot on this new form of power that is able to control in the open. Now, so Foucault is not really related to the disciplinary uh, per se. Uh, in his writings, he's one of the first, and you can find it in the book of Deleuze on Foucault and in his course on Foucault, that he shows that actually he's continuing his work in a way. And uh, we just need to be aware of how, uh, how a social body or a group holds together. So the way they used to make it hold together in what Foucault stigmatized as the disciplinary era uh, changes with, with time. So if you take someone like Taylor, you know, Taylorism, Taylorism was his minutage of production, 
You know, Taylorism is really someone who uh, has a clock in his hand and you have to do these gestures with this tool at this moment. And this, if you want, the disciplinary uh, technique, I would not call it a spirit, it's really a way to manage people in order to make them productive with the set of uh, uh, prerogatives that you had. And this was uh, an early form of capitalist production. Now, if you take today's, uh, uh, the way Toyota produces cars, which is uh, managed by uh, a system of uh, uh, forecasting the demands by taking demands from the client on uh, portable uh, machines like computers, etc. Uh, this way of organizing the factory is uh, that can include in itself uh, previsions, simulations of demand and the like is different from the Fordist model, which would be more of a disciplinary model. So this is why I don't, I think Foucault really claims and reclaims the outside. And this is part of his, uh, of his philosophy that these uh, disciplinary societies, control societies, they're open on practically all kinds of events that can come from technological mutations mutations in the, on the art sciences or whatever mutations you have. And I think uh, if we read his books, it's very clear that he's very careful to detect uh, mutations here or there to, to tell you that something is happening and it's changing. So it's not that discipline is something which is there and you can never get out of it. So a simple example that comes to mind is the introduction of the carceler car, you know, the cars in which we put prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, while before that, in the sovereign era, we used to exhibit the prisoners. So he, he, he's trying to show us that there are mutations on that level. And this is why uh, we need to be able to assess these mutations. So to, to just conclude with another example, if you take the, the crossing of the eye by Rem Koolhaas and his intervention of the panopticon, this is also a mutation that needs to be assessed. So to, to finish on that and answer the boss question, I, I think that uh, it's rather an attention to, 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 to these changes that occur. Uh, so I hope I answered more or less. Um, uh, thank you, Faris. Uh, Angela, if I can just quickly interrupt uh, so that we can include other questions. David Landis has a question. Yeah, I just saw uh, it. You saw it um, mm -hmm. in the chat. Do you want to address his question? Yeah. Um, so yes, David is asking, um, uh, what, can you speak a little bit towards the aspects of uh, your talk when they are brought into our contemporary mode of scholarship? Uh, what options, considerations, and hope do we have to engage with? What you suggest while we are operating under these increasingly constrained scholarly conditions, or more simply, how does your talk confront our contemporary practices of scholarly production? Thanks, uh, David. I think, I mean, my, my talk uh, had I mean, in a, in a sense, more or less like modest, right? Goes to bring in um, this confrontation, or I put on uh, on those terms, a confrontation between um, methodological approaches and between political posi positions uh, from times that are similar but different from ours, <laughs> 1930s and 60s, um, in the context of uh, failed revolutions one being the Bolshevik and its aftermath, <laughs> second being again the Bolshevik, but also the 60s uh, um, France, and but also um, the process, processes uh, of Americanization or American cultural domination that had began in the World War II period. Um, a sort of something that we can take up in our, uh, for our contemporary present as we Humanity scholars are, yes, operating under uh, various constraints um, on the one hand, under various pressures of uh, instrumentalizing knowledge, instrumentalizing our work politically on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, becoming basically servants for other disciplines as arts and humanities are seen as um, passe or redundant, etc. I mean, I, I, I don't uh, I, I don't have any prescriptions, but my position itself uh, is is a bit more conservative, uh, in a sense that um, our work will be always untimely. So 
it is through the untimeliness of our work that because we are dealing with the past often, but also the past as it is uh, as it is articulated, right? For the for, through the moment of our present, I wouldn't say for the needs of the present because I'm not talking about instrumentalizing the past uh, for our contemporary present. Um, that I mean, we will not we will never be relevant in any in any case in the current conditions. But maybe this irrelevance is something that um, we can hold on to, in a sense that. Um, we are not producing scholarship that is avant les lettres instrumentalized as a weapon, right? For identity politics, for, I don't know, liberal discourses, for policy, and on the other hand, um, still, still continue to do what we are doing in a very kind of, um, in, in a fashion that like our university itself might think that uh, we are done with or we need to be, <laughs> Uh, we we need to be shrunk or we need to be excluded. I know I'm not giving like a very articulate and hopeful uh, hopeful su su suggestion, but um, I I think uh, in a way um, for me what is important is to precisely articulate th those moments uh, of our recent past of our past um, on their own terms, right? On their own terms, rather than instrumentalizing for our for the needs of our present and this very articulation can open up um, can, o can open up scholarship towards um, our own again like an outmoded word our own heritage um, that is also immutable that is also adjustable um, but I I'd like to maybe uh, return the question back to the audience some of my colleagues and students and and see how they see themselves within the contemporary world of, right? How, how do you see arts and humanities um, here? <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, Hala? Uh, You're uh, muted. Uh -huh. Andrea? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it, um, I have a question. Uh, I, I think it sort of rides the wave um, with uh, David's question. Um, in terms of, um, because um, the text that you are uh, bringing up, um, uh, notably like Edward Fuchs, Benjamin on Fuchs and um, TJ Clark, um, uh, with in contradistinction to like Gombrich's text, um, and I just wanted to give a, a bit of context to uh, my question as well. So the other day, Natasha was telling me that um, uh, Eflux is uh, doing something like some, I don't know, some book or talk, I, I don't know, uh, on what it is to be human today. Uh, sort of like, sort of these kinds of, they're posing these kinds of questions like, you know, there's something else that is happening today. And um, I, um, so yeah, um, just to focus the question, I was w wondering, um, because there, there seems to be some kind of like prescription to um, uh, uh, the, the demand to historicize, um, 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 but in, in the sense that you, you sort of, um, because you said that it's sort of much harder now to, to name the enemy or identify an, your enemy than it was in the 30s when it was uh, so easy to identify like fascism uh, when it's there um, or in the 60s uh, and then now we are in a similar moment um, but the uh, enemy is uh, much harder to identify and so um, yeah so basically um, kind of um, this call to uh, historicize uh, something that seems or to resist historicization um, or like systematize something that seems to resist systematization uh, and so a call for kind of like s scholarly work to to basically do this kind of work and not re and resist the temptation to think that you know s something else that is happening right now than it was before. I don't know if my question is uh, focused enough, but yeah. Mm. Um, you're asking whether... Um, I yeah, mean, basically, 
Mm, yeah, because uh, because uh, the when you said like uh, there is some, something because obviously we are uh, what is happening now. I mean, hap is similar to what happened in the thirties and the sixties, and but now there is. Um, uh, it seems like perhaps outmoded. To say you have to name the system. Um, but this sentence was being said in the 60s, and it seems more relevant now than it ever was uh, because it appears so unidentifiable. And so if scholarly work or this kind of uh, practice can sort of do the work of historicization in that, in that sense, and so then that would kind of like continue uh, the call that T.J. Clark makes in his text on the social history um, of art, um, even though it seems so outmoded, perhaps it's not necessarily so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you. And I mean, that's why, I, I, mean, I mean, all these calls that, uh, I mean, all these, you know, different camps that we are talking about on the one hand, you know, the, the liberal humanists and on the other hand, um, the Marxist leftists, let's say Benjamin and T.J. Clark, my argument was that even though very, very politi politically very different, right, they also share, um, they have something more in common than we'd recognize. On the one hand, you know, the, the one camp uh, uh, argues that it's through autonomy of truth and that the heritage can be uncovered and that has a preservational uh, effect on culture and civilization vis-a-vis -vis barbarism. And on the other hand, um, and, and then it can be weaponized, <laughs> it can serve post factum, right, if we can say as a political weapon um, in, a, in ideological and historical confrontations, but also and on the other hand, like let's say for, for Benjamin, art and scholarship is always already political, right, though again, like there is a nuance here, uh, the, polit the politicization is ultimately towards um, and, and the quest, right, for universality of, and truth is identical with the quest of the proletariat in the context of class struggle. But what I want to bring in is that in all these cases, what is um, what characterizes all the scholars is that they always discuss art and scholarship in concrete historical circumstances. And it's through concrete historical circumstance, circumstances that the past um, is brought back somehow into the present. Um, and, and today, I think this it's more than ever relevant to insist on this concreteness, while kind of ex coming to terms uh, with capitalist totality, right? Yet the totality, the way in which appears from concrete historical circumstances, concrete geographies, um, it's very important. And I, I mean, especially like, uh, Sorry to bring in the context here, the context of Armenia um, and the revolution of 2018. It hasn't been recognized as a revolution because it does not fit into, like globally, right? It does not fit into some leftist uh, schematic conceptions of what revolution is. <laughs> Neither is it is recognized as a revolution because it does not also fit into the West's um, more mainstream liberal schema of what a post-Soviet revolution means as a liberation from authoritarianism. And it's uh, here a kind of a social emancipation is combined with a national liberation struggle, which is outmoded, and which <laughs> sounds really nationalist in our so-called post-nationalist global context and so on. Um, but yet it is, I mean, for, for me, I mean, and, and I wrote this about this recently, it's a rare occasion in the past decade or so when a revolution succeeds, right? succeeds uh, not in any kind of epical historical way but succeeds in terms of overturning a regime and uh, um, kick-starting basically social processes of institutional building so yeah i mean i think revisiting the mo these moments of historical danger there are concrete moments of historical danger in which the scholars intervene uh, 38 post uh, 60s and so on um, that uh, call upon us to also intervene in our present from the concrete situation of our historical moment, historical present, that I agree with you, that is in many ways a repetition of these very moments, right, that we, of the 30s and 60s on a different plane. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. We can go, uh, 
I mean, I feel like the conversation is picking up right now. So um, maybe we can go until 7.15. So if there's a few more questions. I sort of have one. I don't know if you can hear me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Josh. Hi. I'm going to remove my thing. Let's see if that works. Or my thing is not on. Uh, okay. Now it's on. Well, I mean, we've had this conversation many times before. I'll just pick uh, three words. Uh, truth, freedom, and rationality, right? So I'm not sure if there should be any equation with truth and freedom. For example, uh, the Stoic said and Kant agreed that you can be free in prison or in, a, in an unjust society. And you are very unfree even when you're emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And then, you know, the idea that truth is somehow um, non-instrumentalized or can't be instrumentalized, Plato would disagree with you, Lenin would disagree with you, right? The very idea that, or even Averroes would disagree with you. The very idea that, you know, you can have truth and then apply it and everyone will be free, this is a very, very naive idea. So too the humanists, Actually, uh, Richard Tuck talks about this. The Renaissance humanists um, were more cynical and nihilistic than, than, the, than the scholastic scholars. The scholastic scholars still believed in some sort of moral good to uh, military endeavor. Whereas uh, the humanists, like Machiavelli, uh, looked at Timur uh, as a great example of how to you know, conquer and uh, spread the truth and the truth of course meaning at that point you know the great renaissance works of art which were wholly instrumentalized right so the very idea i mean you know where do they get their funding from who are they supporting popes and uh, uh oligarchs and tyrants and whatnot so i just have a big deal of or you know the, the funding of samarkand by timur himself so I just have a big trouble with these, these easy equations that somehow truth is somehow autonomous and you know, this leads to a cult of failure, right? This leads to an idea, the idea that the revolution always fails. Whereas 68 started about a year later in 69 in Italy and lasted for an entire decade. The years of lead, about 14,000 acts of violence and terrorism and it didn't fail at all in that sense. Um, so I was just wondering if perhaps we could uh, unpack these terms, truth, freedom, rationality, because reason, of course, can be instrumental reason, right? But truth requires sometimes instrumental reason, and truth requires unfreedom. So Lenin placing certain intellectuals on boats and telling them to get the heck out of there, uh, whatever Stalin did, or even the Hollywood blacklist, right? The idea that you can just have an endless discussion is a liberal consensus idea, which leads to, yes, useless, endless discussion. And these days it leads to memes and slogans and uh, whatnot. Cedric Johnson's uh, undoing of the BLM discourse in this regard is, is uh, instructive. So you, so, you know, you actually have to have discourse about uh, truth rather than just sloganeering. Right. And of course, in the age we are in now, sloganeering means nothing. Right. It's, it's about it's about uh, Don Pease has talked about this at least 10 years ago, that certain intellectual positions certainly only exist to make people feel good rather than actually leading to any intervention. So, you know, truth should be instrumentalized. Truth has been instrumentalized from Plato to Lenin. And in between, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, supported genocide and wrote very elaborate architectures to support this because Panofsky I think compares Aquinas to the, the, the Gothic cathedral right and then you could compare it to Dante so the entire medieval superstructure of art was quite beautiful and sublime but it was based on, on genocide and prostitution Aquinas also says that uh, prostitution is needed for society uh, just like sewage is needed in a city and you know he believed in truth <laughs> so that's a bit uh, I'm sure you've heard this before from me, but that's basically the gist of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Truth and freedom and so on; these are not kind of absolute 
concepts. Of course, they're both historical and ideological, but of and, and, and a sort of like, you know, historians, maybe historical materialists, um, we need to ask what is real about ideology, right? I mean, Zizek could say, what is real about ideology itself? But uh, what, what I mean by this is that um, while being historical and ideological, they also, um, this, this concept acquire a reality that shape, acquire, acquire, acquire power of shaping reality, shaping discourses, shaping politics, etc. And uh, regarding instrumentalization, <clears throat> the point here is, yes, truth and freedom and reason and so on, they are instrumental and instrumentalized. But I guess why I, why I, I was bringing up these two camp is that um, to say that they are instrumentalized differently. Like <laughs> if someone would give me, you know, like endless money onto my bank account uh, to say go and to, 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 to give me a chance to go just and independently uh, pursue scholarly work to the end of my life. I mean, that would be just wonderful, right? Um, as opposed to, let's say, like receiving a, a, a commission about what to write and how to write. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of vulgarizing, but uh, the point I was making is that, um, I mean, instrumentalized is a very instrumentalizing word. Maybe it's too, uh, it's not nuanced enough, but I mean, from Benjamin's perspective, um, truth and freedom and so on, which he actually doesn't uh, address specifically in the Fuchs essay that I discuss, um, are always already instrumental in the in conjunction uh, with 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 class struggle, right? Um, the truth of the proletariat as kind of a negative class that is not even a class of is com that is coming into being um, as such uh, and is not appearing. Whereas for Panofsky and Gombrich, um, the I mean, especially for for Panofsky, right, as a Kantian, um, freedom in a Kantian sense as the capacity or as the ability to use one's reason <laughs> publicly and through the constraints uh, that reason itself puts forth um, is not an absolute value, right? It exists because of unfreedom. And actually when Panofsky starts with a Kantian anecdote about, human, uh, about humanism and humanity, uh, humanity is not positioned, again, or humanism as a kind of an absolute value, but as something that is always already cut up between animality and divinity, which is, of course, you could go on and say it's a transposition of the medieval good and evil, low and high uh, onto, the secular, onto the secular terrain. But actually in the essay, Panofsky has a very interesting quote from Vico that uh, the Renaissance humanism didn't make a claim that the human is the center of the universe, but Vico actually says, God put the human in the center of the universe so he could, um, turn around and see where he stands, God himself. So it's a much more modest, right? <laughs> Humanity that uh, knows its own limits. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do agree that these are ideological concepts, but what, is it, what, what our goal is, I guess, as historians and scholars is to see what, what, what is the real, what is real about these ideological concepts uh, as well. But thanks for uh, your intervention. Okay, no, thank you. I did, I did uh, get most of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's 8.15. Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. We can uh, call it a night, right? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and 